one. Hello, everyone. Oh, <clears throat> my voice went going through second puberty. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the sixth episode of Daddy Chat. And here with me is the brilliantly amazing historical Han. Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Han. Thanks for that great introduction. <laughs> um, I'm an ancient historian specialising in the art of the Roman Empire, mostly the Near East. Um, and we met through TikTok, through his wonderful TikTok page. Yeah, where I, where you, you make more sensible and inf informative stuff, and I make videos about how I fancy Alexander the Great. <laughs> Although, yeah. recently you did do that video about, it was Marcus Aurelius, wasn't it? I think you did a video. It was one of the Roman emperors that you, you tried to simp for. I can't remember which one it was. I, 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 it was one of your videos recently. Well, by the time this goes out, it'll be a few months ago. I know, I'm quite a big Augustus fan. He's a bit of my, like, crush, my ancient crush. Which, which one, sorry? You're cut out Augustus. Again. Augustus, that, yeah, oh, yeah. I was like, I, I, was, I was trying to remember which emperor it was. Yeah, no, I think Augustus is a justified ancient crush. He is, I will admit, when a lot, a lot of people, when you get into, like, a lot of people that like Rome, their all go-to is always, it's either Augustus or Julius Kaiser. It's always, but I have more time for Augustus fans because Julius Kaiser fans are very, like, I, I love you guys. I love you guys, but Julius Kaiser fans, you are, is like the first, is the default setting. It's like the default character for Rome. Um, although, I will admit, Julius Kaiser is far more interesting once you dig beneath the surface of his life. What's portrayed in, like, regular mood is quite boring. But I think we're immediately going to start off with something that you, like, said just before we were recording. Um, about the houses, especially Hadrian's villa, because I've never, I've never known anyone to like specifically know about Roman housing. Like as far as I know, is they had underfloor heating. My brain goes, oh yeah, no, underfloor heating, that's cool. And then like that's really where I end, apart from the bath houses and stuff like that. Um, because you know I was fifteen, I was like, haha, naked people, <laughs> like the, you know, classic, uh, classic teenage humor. Um, but yeah, so what are like some interesting things? people don't know about Roman houses or specifically Hadrian's Villa? Roman houses, there's, so, there's such variety. Um, there's a very sort of standard um, layout of a domus, which is like just a regular house that you would probably study at school or at university. Yeah. Um, the standard layout and everything. But Hadrian's Villa is not even like a villa. It's basically... It was its own self-sufficient town. It's incredible. It's absolutely massive. Um, I only specialised, so I wrote my dissertation on a very small section of it, but there was still so much I could have said. But I went and saw it a few months ago in person. Yeah. And I cannot. It was like a frigging, like, country estate. It was huge. Like, I was absolutely pouring in sweat. Oh, yeah, it's, it's too hot. Well, but this, have, got, this goes out in October, so everyone will be really confused by we're swearing. <laughs> It'll be funny. It's everywhere, thank mm. God. But, um, yeah, it's everything's, like, extravagant and huge. Ooh, oh, lost. I didn't hear anything, sorry. Whoops. We've lost connection You're again. Wait. There we go, there we go, we're back. <clears throat> so you wrote... <laughs> You you wrote the dissertation on like the specific corner of the estate. Yeah, it's so it's like the far corner as you would go in, like yeah. the furthest bit away, which is really stupid planning. Um and it's called the Canopus and the Serapeum. Right. So it's sort of like a bit with a canal and then a dining area. It's basically a big space to hold parties. That's just brilliant. that that is that is everything I've ever heard about Hadrian. That just that that encapsulates him brilliantly. It's just I want a I want a miniature village that I, a, a section of is just dedicated to the massive parties I want to host. Oh, there were more places than just that for parties. There were those. There were several parts of the villa that were parties. I think that was. I think maybe there were three main ones or something. I'm not sure, but that was one of the biggest ones, which is why I studied it. So, so half of the villa was basically just dedicated to <laughs> to getting on the sesh, pretty much. <laughs> well, if you think about it, the reason why um, Hadrian or like Roman emperors would have these villas is yeah. one to 
like a retreat, like a holiday home, but also it's a huge part of the job, like with politicians mm. today, is socialising and having parties and galas, stuff like that. So it's basically doing what a big part of his job, yeah. which is annoying because he just basically got to leave Rome and have a holiday. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, I suppose he's got to obviously keep like the senators in line, and obviously if they're if they're happy, because oh yeah, I've got invited to Hadrian's party again this weekend, and from there he can organise. Try. I mean, I think some of the 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 biggest um, deals in history have pr- probably been forged at banquets and feasts as well. Um, I mean, nearly all alliances in Anglo-Saxon England were probably <laughs> forged just purely through drinking. Um, but yeah, no, that's. It's not something I ever think of because obviously Hadrian is mostly known for like just traveling the Roman Empire and building stuff um, yeah. with his boyfriend, <laughs> like like pretty much. That's what, and like that's that's one of the reasons I love Hadrian. He's just just trundle, trundles around and and does a load of stuff. So um, obviously you specialize in the East and on stuff like that. Yeah. What got you like into that, like that, like into that? Because it's not something a lot of people go into. So it's it's. It's it's something especially as well. Like I always say, I like to talk about lesser known histories, and I think it's obvious. It's something that's very important because again, no one talks about it. So, what inspired that direction? So, um, not many people know about this, but I grew up in the Middle East. Um, so my dad still lives there. Um, so I grew up in Saudi Arabia. So I was always sort of exposed to that culture. Yeah. Uh, that sort of like Middle Eastern Arab culture. Um, so that was a big part of my sort of childhood, my upbringing. And then I went to school and it, I came to school in England and I, as a teenager, and sort of came down the whole woman in STEM route. Um, and I did classics A level, but I was still focused on like, biology and I went to uni to do biology. And I quickly dropped out because it was horrible. But I had a professor in my first year of classics who specialised in the Roman Near East. Um, and I always thought he was really cool. Um, and then in second year, I did a module where I could pick any topic of the ancient world. Um, and I had to do a creative project about it. And I ended up doing it on the Nabataeans um, and social media. So sort of thinking about how a Instagram account with that would focus on like history communication would talk about the, Nabate- the Nabataeans for like a week. Right. So... <clears throat> I actually reached out to him and was like, hey, can you help me with this? And obviously the Nabataeans, their sort of region is often, lim- people think, oh, it's just Petra, but it wasn't. It's also in the Middle East. It's in, well, other parts of the Middle East. So there's a really famous site in Saudi Arabia in the northern, northwestern part. Yeah. So that, And then he jokingly said to me in a meeting, he was like, oh, you've got to pick my module next year. And I did. Um, and it was all about Petra. It was called Petra to Palmyra. Um, and I obviously just finished my year, my last year at uni. Um, so I did two classes of that every week for a whole year. And I quickly realized that I was really good at it and I really enjoyed it. And then I had one class in February or January this year where we did a topic and I was the whole, the whole time in the class, I was just sat there thinking like, oh my God, this is so cool. Straight away after class, I emailed my professor and I said, hey, um, do you think this would be a good idea for a master's? Because I really enjoy it. And he's literally sent me an email back in two minutes saying, yeah, go for it. This is brilliant. So that's why I ended up where I ended up. If that was a bit annoying, but... I mean, I think I think part of, um, part of what inspires interest is the journey, I suppose. So, you know, like obviously a bit a bit of a wobbly route getting going but then once you find it you 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 connect with what you're find, meant to find passion i mean i had a, a million different things i was gonna be. I, I was either gonna be a zookeeper a cgi animator um and then i settled on um um i went into study film i didn't do a master's in it um so you def- left definitely heading on that i uh, um yeah i'm probably the least qualified person ever to talk about history unless it's to do with films <laughs> that's why i just do funnies um well no um i i do think it's 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 interesting like the differences um in in act between academics and just regular history buffs like you guys are like so honed in and then 
like I, I I know random bits, and it's it's interesting that the different ways it's viewed. Because obviously, coming from an actor, uh, when I was on your live stream specifically, when I was like, I'm open minded about everyone's news, and you just immediately cut me down, which I I deserve that. I I did derail your life. I still feel bad for that. I was so bad. It's um, fine. That was that was funny. I didn't know how to. I think you handled that. It was a question about the Baghdad battery, wasn't it? That we got, and I think you handled that a lot better than I did. Because I, I just sort of panicked and I was trying to disprove it and then accidentally was like, accidentally was making it sound more reasonable. And I was like, no, that is not what I'm trying to go for. I was trying to be like nice and stuff. And then I should have just done what you did and was just like, no, it's 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 stupid. <laughs> but I think it's hard because the people who, we wouldn't have platforms if there weren't people, average people that wanted to learn about history. True, true, um, yeah. And so, and the the average person maybe doesn't, you know, I think I think the line between ancient history and conspiracy is so thin. Yes. Because it's so far away, it's so mm. removed from us, or yeah. from, that we think, and that's why it's so easy for conspiracy theory theorists to sort of prey on that um, sort of. I, I want to say void. ignorance in a nasty way. Like it's just like you're unaware. Yeah. But it's so easy to try and convince people that something could have happened that we just don't know about it. It's lost to time, um, and you've got to be careful because we wouldn't have an audience without those people. So we've got to, mm. I think the way you handle it, I, I sometimes think I'm a bit too harsh. Yeah. But you, you do have to be careful because at the end of the day, people probably just want to learn and you don't want to snap at them because to you yeah. it might seem really obvious, but it's not obvious. You know, I, most people don't spend three years of their life just focusing on one very small thing. Oh, yeah, no. It's... um. It's the same, like, for me, when obviously, because where I study film, I can know the ins and outs and that, and trying to explain it to someone who doesn't quite get it is hard, because you're sitting there going, no, 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 this is the exact. Um, obviously, I do, I do, tr like like you say, it's so thin, like, I do try and be open-minded, but there is a level where going, like, saying, oh yeah, maybe humanity started a civilization a little bit earlier and then it collapsed, that's, you know, plausible. Saying that the pyramids are giant flying spaceships, you know, it's, it's like the the leap. Like every time I see that picture, it comes up on like my um like my feed on Instagram, like every six months or so. Like someone going, look, if you look at the shapes, you could see where the jets could sit. And every time I'm sitting there, I'm like, I know who I want to send this to, but I know I will be blocked on every single platform if I do it. I would find it hilarious. I have been um yeah, it's tempting, but how how. Do you, do you have like a module on how to like counter that at all? Because I've always like how do, how does academia like counter stuff like um the ancient astronaut theory stuff for example? So interesting. We spoke about this before in live, and yeah. I told you I had notes on this, and I'm not in Nottingham, so I don't have my notes, <sighs> but I can tell you what I remember. Yeah. Um, so I did a module in first year called Great Discoveries in Archaeology, yeah. and our second. So our first class was intro to the module and our second class was all about pseudo archaeology. Um, and I was like quite naive. I went into that thinking pseudo archaeology, they're just going to be like, oh yeah, ignore ancient aliens. People are weird. Mm. Um, but no, it's really interesting. It's, it, it just sort of, I think it's really good that they try and get that into your brain in your first year. Because when you're yeah. sort of 18, 19, you're so vulnerable to information. You're going to trust everything that someone's going to tell you if you think they're in a position where they wouldn't yeah. lie. So we sort of, I can't remember the examples we used, but we, there's an author, there's two American authors who write um, pseudo archaeology and it's called something like Something of the Gods. Um, I can't remember his Chariots name. Of, Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken. <laughs> Yeah. yeah and we were told like this is this is a problem why it's a problem how we can best counteract that yeah sort of use you should always use your position as a historian as someone qualified to try and change people's minds because yeah. it's so toxic for those sorts of ideas to be widespread mm. because also a lot of these um People don't often think, oh, the Romans were visited by aliens, they helped them build the Colosseum. They think, oh, the Egyptians or the Aztec or the Maya, and they have all these yeah. they, weird sort of like racist connotations. 
and they sort of trying to like debunk what they could have done because they couldn't possibly have done it kind of a thing so yeah. pseudo archaeology is like completely intertwined with racism whether it's active or passive so that's like a big thing that we're trying to tackle as like a field is the sort of underlying issues with like that yeah. that's why we're really so passionate about it because to somebody on the internet it might be like oh it's a fun conspiracy theory but it's often tied with like other issues yeah i think i i i, I think there is a, a a definite need to like you have the people who are very far down a rabbit hole who ha have definitely attached themselves to negative connotations but the average joe on the internet who's like oh this is just a fun conspiracy theory i think like there because a lot of people i think the easiest way whenever these conspiracy theories come about is everyone in that group gets lumped together and is immediately put in the bad category which yeah. then inevitably leads to everyone in that group being lumped together and becoming part of the bad category and i think it's the best i mean the way um the way because i started down like i watched the whole history channel thing oh you know and I, I again i said this on live and i was so heartbroken you just, like lost all respect for me in that live but um like because i can remember when i first heard the like that it had racist connotations i was like what no why would history channel be talking about that and then i looked into it i was like oh no there is a darker side to this theory i don't think um, like even Eric von Daniken, I don't think he was because he talks about a lot about it Italian romance art. He's a, he probably is just a bit out there. I wouldn't say he himself, yeah. but some people have taken the ideas that he put forward. Obviously, you know his ideas are completely false. Um, but I think it's important to drag people out of it while before they hit that dead point. I mean, uh, <laughs> that that's when you get onto like the lizard people running the various empires throughout. Like it can go, it can go into a very quick. Like, like I say, there is, there is the funny parts of it. Like the Egyptian pyramids could could fly and stuff like that. But it's like you say, it's the, it's it's trying to find ways to tackle the darker parts of that that um, it must be difficult. It must be stressful as well. Um, like when you get those, because obviously, like you say, you get people who are curious and just asking questions. And then I think I've seen a couple of your videos have some very hardcore people get mad at you yeah i think i'm sorry i wasn't being rude i was just trying to see this famous book um but yeah people i don't know what it is but that i was gonna say one of them is like a bestseller with like millions of copies sold which is terrifying but that's all i was going to say but um yeah, yeah it, it is difficult because a lot of people get mad at you and you just have to sort of think is it worth trying to reply to that mm. individual or is it worth just like blocking them or deleting their comment or whatever like it's just you have to try and judge it because i don't think yeah. there's like a right way to deal with people it's definitely case by case yeah no it's 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 definitely the i mean now i've got to the point where i if if someone starts getting like i'll i'll, I'll if i look at a comment i'm like i'll say my piece i used to try and say it all the time but now i'm like yeah, no, we're just going to ignore that. Like, 90% of the time, if I see it, like, a lot, obviously, I talk a lot about Alexander. Um, yeah. the, the, the the hate I get a lot is um, I will try, so obviously, in going over it very briefly, because it's Balkans, and Balkan politics is scary, and I don't want my channel to have hundreds of hate comments. But, um, so, North Macedonia and, um, obviously, Greece both claim ownership of Alexander. And yeah. I always answer as I've come. I've I, I actually my original video on the subject on YouTube I don't like anymore because a lot of the arguments I found you know are aren't fully on it. Um, and also I argued I argued about his teacher in Aristotle and stuff, and I'm like, no, okay, this doesn't really fit. But the way I always explain it now is he was Macedonian for a time. He was a Hellenic king. He was a Greek warrior king, and in the modern yeah. sense, he is Greek. However, I still get a lot of people in a very nationalistic sense who very get very mad at me for saying that. And um, yeah. it's at that point, whereas now 90% of the time I, I just block because I'm like, it's it's at the end of the day, I, it's my mental health. And, like the yeah. that's what it boils down to. If like you spend too long arguing with someone on the internet, you lose focus of real life and what you're trying to do. Um, yeah, this got a bit darker than I anticipated. It was about to get... Let's go back to the the the, the fun stuff. So, um, uh, yes, what's what? Yeah, tell you what, what's your favorite piece of Roman Near Eastern art? 
easy. There is a there is a relief from a temple called the Temple of the Gad in Dura Europus, which is in ancient eastern Syria, yeah. um, right near the river Euphrates. So this piece, this relief, um, well, there's actually a pair of reliefs, and there may be a third that's um, in pieces. We can't really see it clearly. But these pair, this pair of um, reliefs would have gone either side of the cult image. Yeah. And they're so cool because they're the same sort of layout. There's three figures, three figures. The middle figure is um, one is a male personification of the city of Juriropus, or sort of like the luck of the city, the sort of it's it's a basically personification. The yeah. other one is the personification of Palmyra as a Taiki. So again, the luck, but a personification as like a minor god. And then on the right hand side, as you're looking at it, both are being crowned. One by um, the first Seleucid king, Seleuc- Seleucos Nicator. And then the other one is being crowned by a Nike winged victory figure. And then on the left of both of them is the dedicant himself, literally shown doing um, burning incense and sacrifice. And I just, I love it. They're so beautiful. They're in um, Yale's mm. museum, but they've yeah. got a whole digital archive online. It's really great. That's brilliant. I didn't know Yale had a museum. I thought I just thought they like were linked to the Smithsonian. I didn't know Yale themselves had. A, that's that's cool. Yeah, um, the Yale Gallery or something. But it is. It's got a huge amount of finds from Jury Ropers in particular because when it was excavated a hundred years ago. It was done with joint archaeologists from the Louvre and from Yale. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we 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 love a bit of collaboration. We love a bit of collaboration. Do you mainly study in the UK, or do you get to go to these? Because I saw you went to Rome recently to to um to have a visit. So do you get to like look at the stuff like where it was excavated or as it's coming out, or is that more archaeological that I'm thinking? Yeah, so I am going to be doing an MRes in archaeology, but the Near East particularly Syria um, and Iraq, which is the stuff where I'm going to be looking at from. Um, a lot of it is no longer in situ, or if it was, it's been destroyed. Yeah. Um, and it's not really safe to go there. Um, but thankfully, um, there is a lot in museums. So I don't get paid to go, but I'm off my own sort of back. I'm going to go to Copenhagen, hopefully, to look at the museum um, there um hopefully the Louvre and if I can figure out how to organize the money I would like to go to Yale to have a look yeah uh, getting to America is um is expensive obviously I I, I, ch- I chat to a few content creators um in America and they've all they've all said oh you should come over sometime I'm like yeah but it's gonna cost me like 600 quid to get there and that's bef- that's without yeah, getting I, back I want to go to Yale Stay, have to stay there somewhere yeah. and then you know go, you, when you go to america you're going to want to go all over right to, or like oh, yeah. to as many places as you can because it's so expensive so like i'd want to go to new york to go to the met and you know i would probably want to meet up with some people like who are content creators while i was there and there's just like it would just have to be factoring in all the money although i'm hoping that there might be a research grant i can get for yale or you know, maybe in like six months you'll see me like trying to fundraise. I mean, I mean, you might as well. That's what that's what you know. The the, the whole content creation's for is about engaging. And if obviously as you raise the money through creating content, you can go out and afford to create more and more content. I mean, I I really want to 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 go up north. My particular place. Um, I don't know how much you would have gone into it. I I really love York and Ibarracum. I am absolutely obsessed. Um, it's one. It's a more recent obsession. I will be honest. I did a last October, because this episode will be going out roughly on Halloween. Um, but uh, last October, for I, I did a Halloween video specifically on Roman ghosts, and I very briefly covered the ones that are meant to be in Rome, like Julius Caesar's meant to wander certain bits. Um, there was a particular Roman emperor's wife, who a name is currently left my brain, who's meant to run along and and pinch men's bottoms. Um, which I I was like it was it was one of my favorite videos to research because it was just insane. But York 
um, actually has the highest um, like collection of Roman ghost sightings. Um, again, this is me being open-minded. I'm not saying yay or no. You, my, my classic, the thing everyone hates me for is I just go, oh, I'm not taking a side. Um, that's, um, yeah, my most annoying trait. Just all of my friends say that. Um, but yeah, no, there's this particular ghost sighting that happened. So there's this pub. Um, which had like a small Roman like bathhouse underneath, not a proper one. It was like more of a private residence. I can't remember the name of the pub. Um, and I hang on, your sounds cut out. Hang on, say again. Is that a via? There is a pub there in in York called the Roman Baths or something. Um, it might just be called the Roman Bath. I can't remember. I have it in the video. This is what oh, my my memory is awful. This is why I have barely any dates or anything like set up. Like if you watch any of my videos, I say the dates to events and people's names like four hundred times. It's not because I'm trying. It's not because I'm trying to be sarcastic or like pedantic. It's because as I'm reading the script, I'm trying to make sure I'm saying the correct name, <laughs> so I say the same name. But, you know this it's this. German. So it is called the Roman Bath. Yeah, it's in the cellar of the pub. It's in yes, the middle they, of York. Yeah. Um, so one night, the, the manager and other guy volunteered to stay the night in the actual cellar bit. Because um, when they were having renovations, no one would go in and work in the cellar after dark because they would say people things were brushing against them. Um, now, if I remember rightly, you can actually pay to go in the cellar and go down, um, which because whenever there's a ghost sighting, it will become tourists very quickly. Um, I had yeah. a debate with my uh, one of my friends who's like um, who's Italian, uh, and I said I really want to go to the Colosseum because you're meant to be able to hear the animals and the rattling of chains and gladiators like um, preparing for combat. And he just looked at me flat in the face and said, "I guarantee you, there's there's a guy behind the wall just making weird noises to to sell tickets to 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 silly Roman enthusiasts." And I was like, "I wouldn't be fooled by that." And he just looked at me and he went, "Yeah, I would get really excited and I'd be fooled by that." <laughs> but um. So what they did was they spent the night in the cellar and nothing was happening. The manager, as in all ghosts, good stock, ghost, good, good, uh, good ghost stories. The manager looks around and laughs and says, "Oh, nothing's going to happen." Then apparently, a shining light appeared, and a Roman like senator appeared, like in full toga, and just like just sort of nodded at them and then walked off. Right. Weird. The manager. The manager quit like two days later. Um, Obviously, my fascination is more historical because when I was looking, I, I like I love the pits as well. Um, I, it's not just me going, oh, cool ghost stories, but it's because like York was like it has such rich history. Obviously, right, it was called a barracum under the Romans, Jorvik under um, the Danes and the Norse. Um, like York to me is possibly one of the the best historical places in the city. And this, yeah, sorry, I went on a complete tangent there. We're meant to be talking about. Um, oh, so we live out. Oh. An hour away from York, yeah. well, where my parents live. So we go quite often. And I actually went a few weeks ago to go see the Rydell Horde um, exhibit at the York Museum. I think I saw on your Instagram story, yes. Yeah. yeah. I've actually got some film, like some videos to actually make TikTok about it. But I, I, I did them on my mum's phone, so I haven't got storage. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love York. I think it's got so much layered history. Mm. It's got more recent history that's really interesting yeah. i say more recent like a few hundred years um well in historical my... terms that is pretty recent to be fair yeah and i i particularly love that um in york they've got a blue plaque um where they had the first ever lesbian wedding in the uk with Anne Lister. i love that's that brilliant. that's so cool yeah i tried to get a photo for my friend and it was locked like 10 minutes before the church doors uh... i was like no i need to take a photo Oh, it's always so just stuff. I'd, 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 you'd have to sit there and like camp outside so you're ready the next day. But no, York is an incredibly special place. Obviously, um, that was where the I believe it was the what one was the one that went missing? Was it was the Legio Ninth, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was the Ninth Legion that was meant to have gone missing up in Scotland. Which I'm not gonna lie, having looked into that, I'm pretty sure they just got restationed in North Africa. Um, I'm that is that is that's one of the little historical conspiracy theories that is pretty harmless. Um, it is pretty harmless, but I'm fairly certain. Like, yeah, the the pics may have absolutely obliterated them, um, but I think it's more likely 
that they just went, yeah, we'll put you in North Africa. That's like a lot of the stuff I've looked at. The the, the Lost Legion was almost certainly just restationed, which is probably going to upset a lot of people. I don't know much about it. I've seen the movie. Um, oh, no, that movie. Ruined oh. Britain's, I think. I don't know much about it. Yeah, I, I veered off course. I said, I said before we recorded. I said as a warning, it will veer off course so quick. Um, we'll bring it back round to to Rome. So, as I see itself, like um, how early, how far back does your does your knowledge, especially of the artwork of Rome, go? Because it's it's different. Like um, I, I I think you again. It's something you put up. I believe you put up a video about the Etruscan boar not actually being. As spot on, or am I like, always imagine? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I, I remember it, commenting on it, being really upset because you was like, I, I, you, I, did you did you say it wasn't real? Or it was a wrong date. I can't remember what. Oh, it was a forgery. The, wait, so the actual Etruscan ball as a whole it's was not real. It's so well, gutting. Real. Legit. That that was that was like core to my his, like historical identity for ages. <laughs> like, and every history page I follow, everywhere you went, you could not escape that ball. Um, it's very. It is a good forgery. Um, it is a good forgery, but uh, no. So, like, looking obviously, we've looked at briefly at Ro- um, near Eastern Roman art. So, Rome itself. You said you knew a bit. Do you know, so? Do you know a bit more about like the architectural side of the artwork, or is it like? Mosaics and bits and bobs like that. Quite a bit about art from even like prehistory. Well, not prehistory, but like the very ancient Aegean, so the Minoans. Yeah. Um, oh, I love I, Minoans. Don't get spoken about enough. I've seen like one documentary and read like a couple of books on them, and it agitates me how amazing they were. I think the closest I've seen in, of representation of Minoans is in Assassin's Creed Odyssey when they talk about the Minoans whilst looking at the Mycenaean um, caves, which you'll love this. The Mycenaeans are used as a connection to the Isu, a.k.a. the ancient aliens of the Assassin's Creed universe. <laughs> but sorry, I interrupted you completely then. <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm really fortunate throughout my degree. I've taken, I've always challenged myself by taking lots of variety. So half my modules I've done in archaeology I've studied Minoans, the Etruscans, um, the Near East and the Middle East. I've done Egyptian painting. I've done, I've looked at painting from like Thrace, Asia Minor. My favorite module that I've probably done was about the Silk Road. So I've, I know quite a broad amount of a lot. But if we're looking at Roman art, I think that I feel the most comfortable if we're looking literally in Rome, probably at sort of houses, um, especially Pompeii. Um, I know Rome, yeah, but Italy, um, yeah. or Hadrian's Villa, and I, I'm quite interested. My big passion is seeing how people interact with art, even now and back then. So, if you're looking at a statue in a museum, that yeah. is a completely mm-hmm. inappropriate setting for a piece of art that may have been in a public setting or a private setting that would have changed its meaning. It's a, depending on the architecture and like if it was water, if there were other statues, if there were greenery, like you have to think about replicating that context and then they, you can better understand how they would have engaged with the art. That's really, that's, I've never thought about it like that. I've always just, like, I've seen the artifacts and I, I've never come at it from that. Yeah, because it would be, it would be a completely different idea. Like we're looking at it in a museum setting and going, wow, this is amazing how they made this. And then they would be ha- out on an evening stroll. Like to like when we're walking down, um, like when you're walking past like Nelson's Column, I'm sitting there walking past, oh, yeah, hi, Nelson. And they're just walking along saying like, oh, yeah, there's there's Heracles. He's just hanging out. Which a lot of, um, how, how true is it? A lot. As far as I know, isn't it a lot of the statues were actually coated like in bronze originally? They weren't just white stone. Or have I heard misheard that somewhere? So I'm not sure I've ever heard about that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I don't know all the answers. But yeah. a lot, obviously in ancient Greece, bronze was the preferred medium. And then when yeah. the Romans were being inspired by Greek art and copying it, essentially, 
they would prefer to do it in marble. And marble is a bit more weak, so they would add things to be supports. But marble yeah. was mostly paint, so it was pretty much always painted. So that beautiful picture of um, the statue of Augustus of Prima Porta, he had this almost gaudy outfit on because it's so colourful and we are just so used to seeing that stark white marble. Yeah. So it's, it, that's another thing is colour would have been added a completely new layer to that experience, that interaction with art. Yeah, I mean, yeah, ne- nearly all of them would have had um, some level of paint applied to them so they would have, would the, the statues would have stuck out a lot more. I think that's another thing as well that nearly every depiction, because obviously if you're looking at uh, any sort of Roman media, they're either going to be wearing red or they're going to be wearing just white. Whereas I've like um this YouTuber I watch called Demetron who was like doing a video on it on a Japanese anime about a Roman guy who comes forward to modern Japan, which is a really interesting concept. I'm not an anime person, um, yeah. but I was like I might pick that up at some point because that's a really interesting concept. But they, when they're looking back, they actually show off the different colors that the Roman people would be wearing. It's again. It's something that um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey ironically does pull off a bit better. Obviously, when they're in Athens, everyone's wearing blue and that just wouldn't... Y- yeah, but um, for everything wrong, Odyssey gets wrong, um, they do portray, I think, what people are wearing. Because obviously, if you look back at that, we assume it's just bland, like everyone's wearing the exact same clothes. But everyone, you know, pe- even then, people had personalities. And I think it's easy especially for like regular history buff or even the regular like um person on the street to just like not see them as human if that makes sense i know it sounds really bad but that's it's how it's visualized because it's it's easy it's easy for me to look at you and go oh yeah no you're a human you're in front of me you you know but then if i look at a a, a picture from 200 years ago it's a different there's a list uh, a different connection and I'm, I'm probably not explaining this very well but you get what i mean <laughs> I get it and I think that's why portraiture is such an important medium for like the mm. human connection with ancient art yes. so like cheeky plug because you guys will not be seeing this for a very long time but today I posted a TikTok about the Fayum portraits so the mummy portraits from Roman Egypt they're incredibly filled with personality you can see the twinkle in their eyes the wrinkles on their face birthmarks whether or not they're exact portraits is a completely different thing but they look human. They look real. They've got color yeah. and flesh to their cheeks, you know? And I think that people really forget about that, especially when mm. there's no color and stuff. And I think stone, it's a lot harder to achieve than with painting. Yeah. I mean, um, I, there's there's definitely some incredible um, pieces of, of marble or, or, or stone stonework where it, like, it looks like some of them, the clothing like looks like... There was a... Oh, there was one I saw the other day where um, it was a, a, a statue of a woman and she had the dress, the stonework looked like you could see it was like a, a thin dress and you could see her arm underneath where the dress ended. And I I was looking, I was like, this is incredible. So, yeah, like you say, it's incredibly hard to pull off with stone. Like, that must have taken thousands of hours <laughs> to get to her. <laughs> I was wondering, I'm sure you've heard of this, but there is a story, I believe, from ancient Greece this is such an inappropriate thing for That's me to, to Google. There is... Is this going to completely when, ruin yeah. your search history? <laughs> yeah, this is so inappropriate. But I don't know if it's Greece or Rome. I think it's Greece, but I'm not sure. I was told it in first year. Where a Venus or Aphrodite statue was so realistic and so erotic, essentially, that a man used it as in real life material and you know <laughs> projected onto her wait which so was is this just in the middle of the street or like like no, this yes a temple or something i'm that, not sure. that makes it even somehow that makes it even worse um it actually reminds me of perhaps a, a um a bit more safe for work story where pyrrhus of epirus um, he, uh, oh, it, it was a, he had just come off of his campaign in Sicily, uh, and he had, he'd run out of food, um, uh, because, you know, he'd been campaigning in Sicily and then run out of money because everyone was fed up with him taxing them when he had just turned up to save them. 
yeah. which again, I have a whole rant. I have a two part series on my YouTube about how it annoys me that Pyrrhus didn't move back east to uh, to Macedon when he was offered the throne. He chose to fight people to get take not take the throne he was offered. It anyways, I won't rant about that. It will take me too long. Um, <laughs> But he he goes up to this temple. I believe it was uh, a temple. I don't. Know, it might have been. A, it might have been a temple to Athena, or it was to Hera. Um, it was one of those two. Um, anyways, there was loads of offerings, obviously, as they did. You know, it was um, it was in the south, the uh, Magna Graecia, um, where like the the Greek colonies were. And um, so Pyrrhus just goes. Well, it's nice that you've offered the gods the, these these offerings. They're mine now. So he takes all of the food, loads them on his ships. The ships sail along the Italian coast up to where he's going to back to Tarentum um, because he wants to go back to Tarentum so he can campaign against the Romans a second time, even though he already kind of beat them. Um, the Romans themselves said it was the closest they ever came to fighting Alexander. And because he gave up that fight for some reason, because it's Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus was a brilliant general. He was brilliant on the field. Um... He was a complete idiot when it came to long term planning. Um bless 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 his heart. Um anyways, all of this food was on the ships. And this is a genuine true story. Obviously, um probably highly coincidental, but just because obviously at the time this was seen as a very bad omen, um all of the ships sank in a storm. All of them un and it was specifically the ships that had the food on that he stole from the temple. And it's, yeah, it just reminded me of that story. It's one of my favourite Pyrrhus stories because after that, Pyrrhus, like, kind of self-defeated himself. He, like, he knew he had messed up. Um, and now he yeah. had no, didn't really have any ships. Um, and he would then go on to be absolutely obliterated by the Romans. And then um, later he would ironically return to Macedon to fight for the throne that he was offered ages ago. Um, yeah. Pyr Pyrrhus is an incredibly amazing character to look at, but he's also incredibly infuriating because you're looking again. This is, I mean, to be fair, I am looking at this about what a thousand, like one thousand five hundred years or two thousand years later. So I have got a bit of hindsight to look and go, but the easy answer's there. <laughs> um, yeah, which is another interesting thing. I was actually, uh, again, ap apologies for going on a big tangent, but I was watching. Um, yeah. I was watching Netflix's documentary on, on Rome, which I know has some bits off, um, because it's a Netflix documentary. Um, and we was watching the specific season on Commodus. We was like binge watching it. Um we'd we'd had a little bit to drink. I was drinking rose wine because 'cause I'm a big wine drinker. Um and when we're sitting there and we're like yelling at the T V screen like it's a soap opera, like, do this, why why are you trusting them? They're clearly the bad guy. And then we look at each other and we go we were acting like we could run the Roman Empire with any sort of efficiency. Like, if I was in charge of the Roman Empire, it would last, like, two weeks. Like, <laughs> I would have been like, wait, who's starting a border skirmish? Um, I, I, I mean, immediately I'd be scared of going up into, into Germany. I don't want don't, don't to pull a Varus. Um. I think that when... So I've not seen the Commodus, like, season, um, but I really enjoyed the Caligula one. That was and... such a good show, yeah, yeah, yeah that... Yeah. Oh, such good casting. Brilliant. Mm. But I think that dramatizations always show it in a so much more realistic way than film. Like yes. in, in TV series, it's so much better. And I'm not saying, oh, go watch this um, thing on Netflix, it's accurate. But it's so much more believable whether it's real or not. Yeah. And I particularly, I particularly am a big fan of plebs. Not because obviously it's it's a comedy for the modern world. Yeah. But it kind of reminds you that people haven't changed really and people were just as silly and weird as we are now. It's mm. just different. And I think that that's something that, that maybe you sometimes miss out because it's not maybe... I f yeah, I think good. I feel... As, 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 as the, the, the easiest way to explain this is uh, when in one of my film classes, they made us watch the first episode of Downton Abbey where the Titanic sinks. Right, mild spoilers for Downton Abbey, everyone. Uh, even though I've just said the spoiler, so you know you get a spoiler warning after the spoiler. Um, but the opening scene, they get like the 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 telegraph before my brain seizes up. Um, uh, the telegraph through the Titanic sunk, and the opening words are "Oh my God," um, which is obviously a modern phrase. No one would have said it at, at that point in time. So it's uh, there's also I was I was actually talking about this uh, with Aidan Mattis from the Law Lodge. Um, when he his area of expertise is medieval Europe, um, that's what that's where he studied in. 
um, when he did a film class, um, he wrote uh, Medieval Europe as he understood it from a historian's perspective, and the script got handed straight back to him because they were saying, "Where's the mud? Where, like, where's this?" Which is Again, a lot, and it, it's hard to to meet that balance because as a, when you're writing a film, if I was to write a a, a film about Julius Kaiser's conquests of Britain, right? Um, the he tried, he did try a little bit the second time, um, and that, like if I didn't have the Celts like in muddy and like a bit more barbaric, and then the Romans as like like, you know, these conquerors who are, like, arrogant and... Which, you know, Ulias Kaiser was a bit arrogant, but, it, like, an overplay of that. It's it's playing to stereotypes in a way. It wouldn't... It would be less likely to get accepted if I had, like... Here's the Roman legions. Most of them are, like, conscripts. You know, they all look up to, to, to Kaiser. Um, here's the Celts there, like, and showing their dynamics. It's hard to portray that onto screen because even in a, even in a like, a 12-episode show you've not got the time to really show the human intricacies. So it's going to get simple. I think, um, I haven't seen all of it, but, um, oh, what's it? It's not, I think it is called Barbarians. The one where it shows the, the, when the Romans went into, um, Germania, I believe. Um, it's one of the recent ones, but that comes across. It's all shot very dark and gritty and everyone's covered in mud yes in battle sequences that makes sense but as a day-to-day -day life yeah it, people gotta stay clean like hygiene even animals like you know anyone who owns a cat knows that you know they they stay clean everyone's gotta stay clean otherwise you will get sick and and, and and perish basically um yeah so yeah it's, it's really hard to keep that balance obviously like you say dramatizations because they've got the historical expert on, they have to keep that focus. And if you look at um, uh, uh, the the two dra Netflix dramatizations that have really taken off, um, you have obviously Rome and you have um, the one on feudal Japan. Everyone's clean, and it's like they obviously there's a lot they do in the Japan one. They do the classic samurai move where he like cleans the sword. Uh, that's physically impossible in your arm. One, your armor is just going to like um, blunt your sword, and two, you're not going to wipe someone's entrails on your armor. Um, so, yeah. obviously, they still get stuff wrong, but the 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 simple stuff like cleanliness and and variety in clothing um, is, is portrayed a lot better. And I think it's because they can portray those intricacies because they're not having to build a character. Like, if you made a TV show on Caligula, you then have to give him a, 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 a plot line and a character. Um, whereas if you do a, a, a historical dramatisation of Caligula, you're explaining who he was, you're going over his life, and so you can focus more on the, the tiny bits. And if you include the Praetorian Guard and anything, you just say, the Praetorian Guard killed the Emperor, <laughs> That's what a Praetorian guard's here for, isn't isn't to guard the emperor? Um, I was going to fit a Praetorian guard joke in there somewhere if it, if I had to. I know Caligula didn't get killed by no, no Caligula wasn't. He was killed by his uncle. It was uncle, wasn't it? No, or am I thinking of Commodus? Killed by the Praetorian guard, and he was, he was the Praetorian guard. Yeah, that was yeah. It, yeah. I think uh, yeah, my brain got mod. I, I was like yeah. Ironically, I forgot the Praetorian Guard aspect in that plot. It's because he, yeah, his uncle took over from him. Yeah, that's the bit I was getting muddled up in. See, this is this is why this is why you're here because you're the person who knows it, and I just make the jokes. Um, but yeah, no, I could talk about Killigear all day. I I think he gets a hard rap because he did start off as a fairly decent. What what's your theory on that? Because obviously he started off as an all right emperor. He was pretty good overall. Um, but then he sort of just goes. I believe he goes off at the passing of his sister, Drusilla, isn't it? That's when he starts going a bit more Emperor Palpatine. Well, if, if you if you think of it, there's two ways broadly to think about this. You either think about it for the oh, Suetonius is right. He was canoodling with it. He had this weird, inappropriate relationship. He was messed up in the yeah. head. Whatever aspect and that broke his heart whatever suetonius in my opinion is a liar but obviously okay. like tablets today you know yeah. that's what 
that's where I think it is. There's no smoke without fire, but like, do I really think that he was having relationships with his sisters? No. And a lot of people do believe that. I just don't. I think that this is... This is a person whose whole childhood was turned upside down. And, you know, his father was killed. His older brothers were taken away and killed. Um, He was probably very close to his sisters. He was kept under very tight guard by Tiberius. Mm. Um, And I think that probably his when his support network broke down and he had all this power and people he couldn't trust, that was probably more likely the descending into mental illness. Yeah. But I don't even think that it was mentally ill in the sense that he was fully going off the rails, you know, horrendously. I think it was more like his, he probably became very paranoid, rightfully so. I think it's, it's more like that. I think all these things that we think about like Roman emperors and stuff, they're always exaggerated and you have to try and step back and look at it with the yeah. knowledge we have today and try and be rational. It can all be rationalized. I have that theory about a lot of things, you know. So I think people love to go to say, oh, Caligula was this total freak. His horse was a console, all this yeah. stuff. And it's like, take a there step back. Hasn't, hasn't that recently <laughs> been disproved, the horse was a console thing? I I, thought, I, I read somewhere it was in, um, not that he actually did play him as a console, but it may have actually been just a practical joke. So he wasn't a full console. It was just Caligula going like, ha-ha, this is funny. I've not heard that. It was. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, what I think happened is that the senators were bad at their job, and he would have gone in there, and he or he wasn't satisfied with their work. And I think he said something like, "You guys are useless. My horse could do a better job than you." Yeah. And then it was out of context because that's like you know, as people say today, like, "Oh, a monkey could do that. You could train yeah. a monkey. To do that. It's the same thing." And I think that you have to sort of like try and. You know, but yeah. don't get me wrong. It's it's proven otherwise. I'm very happy to always admit that I'm wrong. I don't know everything. Um, but I think yeah, people just love like like we do today, like they did back then. They love to hop on a bit of gossip and something like funny, yeah. and maybe nasty. They just love it. It's tabloids. Yeah, I don't. I I think with with any sources on the Roman emperors, you have to look at it as they had a lot of enemies, and often after they passed away, those enemies had free reign to write whatever they wanted about them. Um, one of the best pieces, um, there was a historian f- from the Commodus season who was talking about how Commodus actually did a lot of the stuff previous emperors did, like paying money to sen- senators, controlling grain supplies and stuff like that, A lot like holding gladiatorial games. A lot of the stuff he did was very similar. However, a lot of people hated Commodus. So when you're reading about Commodus, yes, he was a bad emperor, does it mean that he was as bad as he's portrayed, especially now? Because we're we're taking our own interpretations of like a thousand odd years apart, probably just a little bit less than that, um, like hundreds of years apart, through an interpretation of someone that hate potentially hated him because he wasn't a liked emperor. It's the same as uh, although. Case in point, a lot of people disliked Julius Kaiser, but the victor was Augustus, who obviously liked him because he was his heir. Yeah, so we have a very negative portrayal of um of Brutus and everyone else. We have the portrayal of uh, Marcus Antonius being a weak leader. He probably wasn't as weak as he's portrayed, but because Augustus was controlling the flow of information at this point. He is a hundred percent a weak leader. Um, yeah. I had a, I had a similar conversation when I had um, uh, bite sized ancient history on, um, where she she brought up where like because I I I was making a point that Cleopatra should have sided with Augustus, but she made the very obvious point. Mark Antony was the clear winner. If it wasn't for Agrippa, Augustus would have been on the back foot, and so the the image we have of Mark Antony not being strategically sound. Is yeah, it's easy for me to analyze his battles and go, oh no, he's not that good at strategy. But compared to again the average person, these people were in these positions for a reason. They'd survived this long for a reason because they were good at what they did. So he probably was nowhere near as bad as how he's portrayed. But because Augustus wanted him to, Augustus wanted to raise how good he looked, um, he would portray it 
in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, interesting, because even um, Herod, King Herod from sort of Israel, um, that's a whole interesting thing, because he sided with Mark Antony too. Mm. He went to visit Augustus after the Battle of Actium in Greece. He went to visit him, and he has a famous, famous speech. He said to Augustus, this whole thing, like, you know, I sided with Mark Antony, blah, blah, blah. And his final thing was something along the lines of, I hope that for you to judge me, it's not who a friend I was with, like, who was my friend. Yeah. It's how loyal a friend I have been that you will, like, respect me and let me live for that. And then Augustus goes, yes. I'm." He said something like, it's my, you know, I'm grateful that you've, this has all happened, but, you know, poor Mark Antony has lost a good friend. I've gained a friend. And Mark, um, and Augustus and Herod became very good friends. Um, and he was one of the first client kings of the Roman Empire in the Near East. Um, and they were close friends for the rest of their lives. So it's really interesting. But a lot of emperors in later years in Rome, they would have these sort of smear campaigns that would go against previous emperors, not because yeah. they necessarily were ever enemies, but because they've got to try and convince the Roman populace that They're everyone better. who saw them were worse than they were in order yeah. to make them better. And it's why Augustus is often sort of, you know, seen so well and so highly regarded, and then Tiberius is not, is because this was the first guy, he did all the right things, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And then it went downhill, but I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to go back to the Augustan age. So that's why they do it, whether it was true or false. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's it's pretty hard because obviously everyone's immediately going to be like, oh, yeah, no, Augustus was like the top. He's the person to beat. And the second Tiberius made even the smallest mistake, everyone was going to be writing, saying, oh, we need someone new. Um if there's one thing throughout human history, humans are quick to do. It's quick to be angry. Um, that's a... Judge. Sorry? You can't and quick to judge. Quick to what? It's kind of keeps going to search? Judge. Oh, judge. Judge. He was coming through his, like, church, and I was like... Huh? Oh, yeah. Um, the, like, the smallest thing he did wrong is going to, to, to backfire on him, and I think that's the... The hardest point, I mean, obviously you've... Don't you have the year of five emperors as well? Like, the the peak? Yeah, later on. Yeah. Because you have, the, you have the, the five good emperors and then far later on as it starts spiralling. Um, that's actually that's actually something I wanted to bring up. There you go. I knew I'd remember what, I, what one of the key topics. Um, do you know much about Zenobia? I don't know a lot about Zenobia, although she was held prisoner at Hadrian's Villa. Um... She is very interesting. The reliefs that I was talking about from Jury Europus earlier, the dedicant of that has his ancestry in the in like carved at the bottom, and there is a theory that she that he was related to Zenobia's husband or something, which is quite cool. Interesting. I but for... and they're very like limited names and stuff, so it's quite it's it's just a nice little theory. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no. See, see, that's a nice little conspiracy theory. That's, there's nothing bad about that. Um, I, I, I again, I don't know a a great deal about her. I, for me, she's a fascinating figure, um, because she really just did not give up. Like when I believe it was already last time I brought this up, I said Marcus Aurelius instead of Aurelian, and I'm haunted by it forever. Again, that was uh on when I was talking to bite size ancient history, and I I'm so haunted by that. Um. Uh, and the fact that I mixed up I mean to be fair in my defence they're two very similar names in my defence Aurelian and Aurelia sorry but um, yeah the fact that Aurelian had her for rights and they caught her with her army completely destroyed trying to flee the city on horseback so that she could go somewhere else and right because a lot of obviously the Romans wrote it as she was cowardice she's trying to flee her people in her mind she was moving to somewhere else to get another army um, there was no way that she was gonna to beat the Romans because obviously they, you know he's known as Restitutor Orbis, he you know the restorer of the world. Uh, you don't get a title like that without being a very good general. Um, but I, I just for me she's fascinating because of that absolute like no no I'm not 
I, I, I've lost, but no, I'm not. I'm not making this easy for you. Uh, again, Aurelian again is is one of the impeccable. But moving on to Marcus Aurelius, um, because he's possibly my favorite Roman emperor, um, purely because of his philosophy. Like I, I, I don't know. I don't know about you. I've spent hours just reading his quote. I can barely remember them, but I reread them so frequently because he's like my biggest motivation. I like. Oh, I'm really not feeling it today, and I just read something from Marcus Aurelius, and I like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, he's a real big. Have you read much of his like stuff or? Loads. So my I bought my dad a copy um a few years ago for Christmas. Um, but because before then, when I was having like a bad day, he would send me quotes from it. Like he would text them to me, which is quite cute. Oh, so I thought I'd get him. Um, but I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. My sort of good knowledge of Rome sort of cuts out a bit before that but yeah I'm not gonna lie I really don't know very much about it that's, at all I just fair. know the emperor with his heavy eyelids and his beard and his curly hair that's fair well, you know what we'll, we'll, we'll just cut this bit about Zenobia and Aure- Aurelian out completely so as far as we know so yeah um so yeah anyways um the the I've forgotten what we were talking about before Zenobia it's fine we'll break up something new anyways um uh, talking about something like, completely different. So, what's your favourite fact about Augustus? Uh, I really enjoy the fact that he was... So, he was really big on morality, um, being yeah. a good person, being a good citizen, setting an example. Um, well, Princeps meant for a citizen, so he was yeah. really big on setting an example. And he introduced these laws on morality, um, sort of like women should have these many, ch- like as many children as possible. They would get rewards for it. Cheating, you would get like exiled, stuff like that. It was or like, you know, any number of things. Yeah. And his daughter and his granddaughter got exiled. He was so stubborn. He wouldn't even let them get away with being, you know, devious. So I love that. I love that he was so stubborn that he kicked out that, his own family. That is brilliant. Yeah, no, that that is next level. Like, no, hang on, no, these laws apply to everyone. Um, yeah, that, you you know, being in the first like generation of the imperial family, he couldn't get away with it, like having them, you know. Yeah. So he had to set the example. If my this is what a good family looks like, and I'm showing you that as the part of familiar. So he was. Pater patria, you know, father of the country, but also a yeah. part of familiar, his own family. You're going to look at how I run my family and you're going to replicate that at home. And leading, you're being... by, le- leading by example rather than command. Yeah, so I think that's quite interesting. It takes a lot of guts as well, because obviously most, like, especially nowadays, most leaders would be like, oh yeah, no, we've, we've got rid of them, they're out of the family, here's your little island in the Mediterranean. Uh, like... About that and you think about how many politicians today will get away with bad behavior or their family members will because of who they are yeah. whereas augustus was really like no this doesn't hold up here get out i think that's... I love... sorry girl this is why i think he's got daddy energy he would be like he would be like get out this, now this, this is why he's your historical crush yeah <laughs> well i was on when I did a live with Cosy's Odyssey, who's this amazing creator, mainly on Instagram, yeah. he was um, so Reese, Roman historian, was like, yeah. "Oh, have you have you picked your like ancient crush yet?" And she immediately went, "Oh, Cleopatra." And I was like, "Shit, you've taken a good one there." So I've got to pick someone else. So that's why I settled on Augustus finally. But you know, mine is mine is. Fairly well known. It's pretty much my core identity. It's, it's me and Alexander. I, I've actually, by the time this is out, it will be a well old TikTok. I've actually recently, over to, uh, on Wednesday, recorded a TikTok about you know all of the um, a lot of the uh, I'm I'm your biggest fan sound that I, um from Lady Gaga. I did yeah. it, but I did it as me traveling back in time to Alexander and then him freaking out because I'm speaking English and so like I get my head lopped off at the end because that's the realistic outcome of that. It's funny, like, my brain was like, I'm going to do this sketch. And I was like, hang on, no, it's it's me. Let's take it to another level. And I was yeah. like, because the realistic outcome of that, if I beamed up to Alexander right now, 
and I, I was like started talking to him. He's going to think I'm like completely insane, and like he's gonna want to get as far away from me as possible. Which is, um, I think even recently, uh, I I I was watching uh, a YouTube video about bringing. It, there's a particular channel they like where they bring historical figures forward, and they were talking about bringing Alexander, the, uh, not Alexander, uh, Alfred the Great, forward to modern day London. Um, and I was like, the, the the short story of this was he would probably immediately have a heart attack and die. Because that, you know, that's going to be such a big culture shock. But he said if we could get him past that, he's obviously the architecture is going to blow his mind away. Um, probably not as much. He would have, obviously, because the Romans were great architects. So the skyscrapers would confuse him. But a lot of the modern houses, he'd be like, oh, yeah, no, you know, that's that's fairly fairly decent. But the biggest thing is, and what surprises a lot of people is, no one would be able to understand each other. Even Alfred the Great, who, what, was uh, about 600, 700 years ago? Mm-hmm. Um, no, no, about 1,000 years ago. 800, no, seven, seven. Uh, it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, right? A mass, uh, like, I, I did not do well with maths at <laughs> any point in my life. Um, but even that, like, a much smaller gap in the same region... Um, like he wouldn't have a clue what people were saying because Old English was so different. It was far more Germanic in origin. It didn't have the Latin influences from, uh, from France. It didn't have the Scandinavian influences at this point. And I think it's just insane how that like difference. E- even though technically the, the like yeah, I don't know what point I was trying to go with there. I kind of lost it halfway through. <laughs> don't know what I was trying to go. With. Like you always think, oh, like if I could go back in time, what that would was I do? That was like, yeah, kind of a thing. Like I love playing the sort of game with friends where it's like, oh, if you could have a dinner party, who would it have been with? Like pick five guests, that kind of a thing. And it's like, yeah, but you're assuming that all these different people from different periods of time and ancient cultures could have communicated with each other. You, or you. You'd have to have to always also add into the scenario that we've all got like we've all been in the TARDIS for a week, so we can like it we've automatically translated for the Americans, that's a thing from Doctor Who. Um But uh yeah, you'd have to have so like some kind of or like some Star Trek universal translator that allowed I feel like it would be an incredibly intre you know who I would speak over over Alexander is Diogenes. I think I brought this up when I came onto your live. I Diogenes would be so interesting. I would love to sit with him and just be like, "Here is three bottles of wine. We're sharing these. I just just talk. I'm not even going to say a word. Just talk." Um, there's a brilliant story with Diogenes. I've told it before, so I'll do it very very briefly. Where it was up to Plato school, where Plato turned around and said. Um, uh, the the a human is a featherless biped. So uh, Diogenes plucks a chicken, and then he goes and puts it in front of Plato's steps of his school, and he goes, "This is your human." And then Plato, humiliated, said, "A human is a featherless biped without claws." And to my knowledge, Diogenes didn't go from again. But by, Diogenes was the original troll. Like he just he just lived to annoy people, and I just I can't help but absolutely admire that. Um. In fact, my favourite Diogenes quote comes from his communication with Alexander when Alexander said, if I, was, if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. And Diogenes said, if I were, if I were Alexander, I would be Diogenes as well. Like the... Yeah. Oh, no. Or it might have been, I, if I were not me, I would be me anyway. So like, yeah, Diogenes just did not care and I, I absolutely love him for that. Um, but yeah, no. Um, Anything else you want to go over? I think we've we've got to about an hour, and so I'll probably start wrapping it up. If you wanted to talk about the Alexander the Great mosaic, as yeah, a sure. bit of an because that's um, something that you mentioned. I, I haven't. I haven't actually heard about that. Are you serious? No, I haven't. Uh, is this the one with him and Roxana? Is this the one with him and Roxana? I've seen no that one. It's a mosaic from the house of. The this is what this is what I mean when like I have a very like my knowledge is wide but shallow. This um like whereas yours is like narrow but deep. Mine's like wide but shallow. It's so, like mine's like a little paddling pool of knowledge. Like it goes on for quite a bit, so it can fit in, in like loads of like family like tourists in. 
but it's not really that deep. I've got a base level of, of most of it. I, I'm learning more about um, Bronze Age Mesopotamia um, because I've yeah. started getting really interested in that. Particularly, I, I started was like, oh, wow, the Assyrians are really cool. And now my brain's like, but the Hittites are are um like just mental and i i will mention them briefly because everyone gets annoyed when i mention them that this that i really want to know more and more about the sea people because the most interesting theory i've heard about or, or hap- hypothesis rather most interesting hypothesis i've heard about the sea people was that they were an early form of celtic tribe which i don't see but it was because of the direction they come from um, I have absolutely no evidence to back this up. I heard it. I haven't done any more research in this. So how likely it is, um, given their armaments, I doubt it because their armaments were very similar to other Mediterraneans. Um, but yeah, I, uh, there is an interesting idea. I've again very much doubt it um, because I don't actually think the Celts were about at that point. But it was an interesting thing I read. Um, yeah. In fact, I'm almost certain that the Celts weren't about at that point in the Bronze Age. I think they were slightly no. When was the first Celtic culture? Is about three. Uh, this is see. This is what. This is why I'm not trusted with any historical. This is why I always, whenever I do this, this is why my videos take like a week and a half to research because otherwise I come out with stuff like this. <laughs> where I immediately go, no, hang on, Ryan, that you said this, but it doesn't sound right. And then I immediately try and go back. I'll leave it in because I don't mind completely embarrassing myself. I think I embarrassed myself more when I was trying to backtrack on when I said, oh, yeah, no, so there might have been advanced civilizations in the past. Realize what I said and was spent the next 20 minutes of your live stream going, well, no, uh, but I, I, I don't mind when I should have just said, yeah, no, that was that should not have left yeah. my mouth. The easy answer to that situation would have been, I, no, that shouldn't have left my mouth. No. The complete answer, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was... Do you want me to tell you a little bit about the Alexander Mosaic? Because I, I am shocked that you don't know because it's genuinely, so famous. This is what I mean. Like my knowledge is like very. I, most of his stuff is the battles. I, I, I'm very big on his battles and his personal life. Well, you're gonna love this because this mm-hmm. is a mosaic from the, from the House of the Fawn in Pompeii. Um, it's a really big house. And it's from the Tablinum, which is the sort of part of Emiliasa's study. Yeah. So it's a study place. Um, in ancient Rome, in Roman culture, what would happen is a wealthier man would have would be a patron, and his um, what's the word? Patronies? I don't know. The people that would come to him as their patron, the yeah. clients, they would come into his house and sort of queue up and wait around in the atrium, atria. Yeah. And then they would go and be received in the tablinum. Um, and right on the floor, the focal point of the whole room is a huge mosaic of, um, that shows the Battle of Issus. So that is Alexander the Great on horseback with his men fighting against Darius the Third, who's in a chariot with all his yeah. men. Yeah, now I immediately. Yeah, no, now, yeah. <laughs> no, I've seen it before. My brain, yeah. My brain just wasn't clicking. It's because it's too hot. It's too hot. When you when you guys are seeing this, it won't be too hot anymore. But right now, I'm quite literally sweltering. But no, that's so cool. Um, I didn't know the location it was. I've obviously I've seen pictures of it, but I had never I never I didn't know it was um in. Did you say Pompeii? I didn't know it was in Pompeii. It's in Pompeii. Um, and it's really interesting because if you look at it in the in the archaeological museum at Naples, it's on the wall, which is one totally inappropriate it would never have been looked at like that it would have been on the floor um and two you're not thinking about it in a room so and and who would be looking at it and from what angle because if you're a a client going into the past familiar's you know study space this is your boss and your boss has got this big mosaic on the floor that's facing you as you're walking in and is he trying to show you his knowledge of um Hellenistic culture is he trying to align himself with Alexander is he just a fan of that mosaic style um because it was probably imported um and we can tell that because there are like 
there are lines in the mosaic where the it doesn't line up properly, which means it was probably transported and misaligned. It wasn't just yeah. from the earthquake. Um, it's or was he just an, an, yeah was he an enthusiast of the art? Was he just a big fan of Alexander's? We have no idea. But you've got to think about this person would have been thinking through their head all these things. Um, and my favorite part of the mosaic is there is a small face on the bottom right corner yeah. of a soldier who has fallen and you can see there's a shield in front of him so you're seeing his back of his head and there's a shield there and in the metal of the shield there is the reflection of his petrified face staring back at you it's That's... incredible the honestly artwork... i like jaw drop moments with ancient art i love it like yeah no, I do. I do love vis vi like visually seeing. It. I'm, I'm my favorite period of artwork. I won't lie. Overall, is probably like sixteenth, seventeenth century. No, seventeenth, eighteenth century. I love those like royal regal portraits. I love that art style. Um, but yeah, no, that is the, like that level of detail. I don't think it's 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 something because at the end of the day, you have to see it as that was their movies. Like, those pictures would tell stories of uh, a million words. Like, yeah. It is It is incredible. Just And that, that that's obviously a power move as well. That's such a power move. Like, you have yeah. to look down to see it. But it goes back to what you were saying earlier, is museums don't convey the message that this no. artwork is trying to portray. Because that's something, like, I, I, I've never got really too deep into art and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the... Yeah. But, artwork is designed for everyone to be able to understand it and obviously changing its location and its positioning can more in more ways than one change its meaning like for example i have a model of the very famous bust right <laughs> now the meaning of this obviously it's a pencil holder it's got the stab wounds in the back um the meaning of this is completely different to what the original artwork is. It's in a different place. It's above. It's watching me work because I like the idea of looking up, looking up at Ulius Kaiser and being like, if I ever go, oh no, I can't be asked to do this. I'm like, this guy literally paraded around, you know, my ha half of the world trying to conquer it. Or, you know, can't be lazy. Um, but it's a completely different meaning to what the original busts and 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 pictures of 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 Ulius Kaiser would mean. Because obviously for him, depending on their situation, it'd either be a symbol of respect or a, like a power move. So it's yeah, it, it's it's. I think it's hard because obviously museums allow it makes it more easily accessible. You're not going to get someone to go out um, to an old uh, like to to the Parthenon. Very few people are going to go to the Parthenon. Um, yeah, but a lot of people will the go. The best to thing that museums. I'm oh, sorry. That's an old old saying was a lot of people will go to a museum. Yeah, I think the best thing that museums can do if they have the funding, which is also a whole issue in itself, mm. is to do replications if they have, you know, if they can replicate the architectural context yeah. and the archaeological context. So a great example of this, even though there's a lot of problems with it, because I'm sure people will be in the comments later, you know, but the British Museum has a number of portraits from Palmyra. And the mm. way that Palmyrian portraits were in found you know in context they were in tower tombs or hypogeum tombs tomb contacts um stacked on top of each other in layers so if you think like a chocolate bar is segmented but a long panel it would be like that but stood up with different um segments yeah. and in the british museum even though it's a big room filled with a lot of different um periods of stuff and different media of art they've got the palmyra portraits up the wall so visually that gives you a better idea but also, you've not got the lighting that would have been assumed. You've not got the sounds. You've not got the smells. You've not got the flickering of light. You Also, these are a bunch of random Palmyrene portraits that are probably from completely different periods, from different tombs, yeah. all mixed together. So they aren't related to one another in the same way mm. they would have been. Not like actually the people being related, but the artworks being meant to be together. Yeah, so you've got to think about all these things. And it doesn't... I think maybe museums should be more open about the limitations, to be honest. Yeah. I think something that would be more helpful oh, yeah. rather than being changing it. Uh, uh, as, as you're going to walk along, you're going to go, oh yeah, here's a load of Palmarine portraits. And then your brain's going to go, oh, these were probably all made about the same time because they're all next to each other. 
Like that's the and that's the it's wrong, but that's how a human brain is going to go. Like that's how it's going to come together. Yeah, and a huge city in the Roman Near East that was producing these for three hundred years. Exactly. So, yeah, and they're beautiful. By the way, if anybody hasn't seen them, you should definitely give them a look. They're very yeah. beautiful. No, they're def definitely um, it's definitely worth visiting. <laughs> And on that note, we will wrap it up because it'll be like an hour and a half and I'm starting to starting yeah, to sweat a little bit. Um, but, you know, thank you for coming on. Is there anything you want to plug um, before you go? Um, I would just say please follow my TikTok so I can earn a little bit of money, please. You I'm to hoping to give you 10K followers by the end of the year. Hopefully. You need to upload more to YouTube as well. I've, I've found your YouTube channel. You need to get on there more. I you know university is too intense but now i have no excuse for for a month or so just 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 a few even if it's like youtube shorts just just purely because you're less likely to get banned off of youtube than you are on tiktok i've there's many episodes of this podcast where i've spent a good 20 minutes just getting angry at the tiktok report system um uh, my favorite my favorite one which i always bring up because it's my favorite story um i had a video taking the mickey out of a certain austrian gentleman um, and how he was a bit of a coward, especially towards the end of a certain kerfuffle. Um, and I got taken down for harassment and bullying. TikTok said I was harassing and bullying Hitler. I made a video where I used that. <clears throat> I didn't say Hitler because you'll get banned for saying the word. But I said um, hit TikTok banned my video for bullying Austria. And that was what the caption was and what I went on. Was up within back up within five hours. <laughs> and I was like... Uh, yeah, I feel like I bullied TikTok into restoring that, but that was, that was, yeah, I, I, I'm just, my jaw dropped when I read that, like, harassment and bullying, I was like, who am I harassing? There's only one person who I am bullying in this video, and I feel like I'm justified. What I want to know is why, so art's supposed to be exempt from the nudity ban, because it's art, Yeah, and yeah. I got in trouble for the statue of Augustus at Prima Porta, because at his little uncle is a little naked Cupid baby. And that was taken down for, like, inappropriate images of a child. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, you've got literal, like, horrendous things happening on this app when you're coming after a statue. Crazy. There was a video I found the other day of someone's pet, like, alligator or crocodile or whatever, eating a rabbit live. And I, I sit there and I, I was like, I'm going to stitch this and put it. And then I was like, well, no, if I stitch and, like, make an annoying video about how annoyed that this stays up when I, like everyone else's like, especially history talk is hit one of the hardest because obviously a lot of the topics that gets discussed um nearly all of the the world war Two history talk gets taken down regularly um but that that's fine and that video is still up it's still on my favorite things because i keep debating stitching it but i know if i stitch it my the vid the stitch will get taken down <laughs> like that's always how it goes but yeah TikTok, you need to sort out your guidelines. But that's that's why I always tell people, head to YouTube because TikTok won't be here in another five years because people are get, already getting fed up with it. There's already people are the user base is going up, but how much people use it, I think, will go down eventually. Purely because it's it's too it's too malleable. It, it, all you've got to do is upset one creator, and then all of their fans are taking down your stuff. We saw it a lot with Vegan Teacher. Um, although I'm scared to mention her name because I'll probably get a video done on me now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, when, when she managed to annoy, it, but she could then weaponize her fan base. Against, yeah. Anyways, too much negativity. We've had a fairly decent positive chat. Um, fun random fact to end it on. This was one you'll like. Um, so there is a Greek historian um, who many of you will know called Herodotus, who is often yep. called the Grand of history yep. history yeah and he wrote um the histories that he would talk about <clears throat> um things from distant lands from near lands but he would he was very adamant that he did his own research and he talked to legitimate people who knew what they were talking about if he couldn't go there and he wrote <clears throat> that in india because obviously he'd been to india not yeah that there were giant ants who would mine gold so if you're feeling like you've been gullible, just think you're at least you're not Herodotus. I I I love. He got a lot right, but he also got a lot wrong. <laughs> and that is, uh, yeah, I do love him. I get 
I, I have a soft spot in my heart for him because that was the first comparison. Because obviously, grandfather history, history daddy. I, the the comparison was made pretty quick, and uh, yeah, I do need to do a full video on Horotos because he he just he did travel. To be fair to him, he did do a bit of traveling. But um, yeah, the golden ants, the golden ants was uh was an interesting choice. I yeah, I like the fact that he was writing that out, and at no point did he go. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, I like the fact. I also like the idea that by now he'd written so much that he was like, I really can't be asked to double check this. Or alternatively, he was like, this will be absolutely hilarious if I include this and everyone yeah. believes me. And I kind of like that third option. Um, <laughs> yeah, that I feel like that would be funny. If, if I was Herodotus, that I would leave random bits that are like so... Yeah so insane that like i would like, I want to see and then i'd like time travel thousand years but i did it work right so yeah thank you for coming on um and uh yeah hopefully Sorry, oh, i don't understand my google's talking to me um okay uh that little cameo from uh google there uh thank you for coming on <laughs> hope to have you on again soon and yeah it was a great discussion and uh, thank you so yeah. yeah and to everyone in the audience bye guys bye bye